Yes. Recording, okay. and yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. So um, this is um, an approach to, uh, or optimizing your approach to engagement and communication strategies for patients with diabetes. And really, I think a lot of this, you guys with your passion and your compassion and your understanding of diabetes are probably already uh, using a similar approach are probably already very aware of this, but these are things you may need to help your team with. I've worked with lots of practices from specialty care practices to primary care practices. And uh, a lot of the issues we're gonna talk about today are alive and well among many clinicians and care team members. Um, People who help take care of people with diabetes can develop what we call diabetes overwhelmness. We're working hard to keep our people with diabetes out of harm's way. There's a lot to do, uh, everything from foot exams, urine microalbumin, teaching them about hypoglycemia, controlling the blood pressure, uh, on and on and on, to keep on top of diabetes and to keep people healthy. And in the middle of this, sometimes it seems like our patients aren't doing what they should do or what they need to do to help them still stay healthy. And so it can be discouraging and frustrating and overwhelming for the clinicians and the care team. And we call that diabetes overwhelming. And to start to dissect that, I think we need to think about what is your mental model or what are your team members' mental model of diabetes? Now, a mental model is the image that you have of something. It's sort of the filter that you see things through and it's based more on beliefs than it is actual facts. It's the explanation of your or someone's thought process about how something works. Uh, how they perceive it, or how Peter Sinji says, mental models determine what we see. So what is your mental model of people with diabetes? Or those you work with, what is their mental model? And are any of these familiar? And sadly, these are actual quotes from care team members. Many of those who have diabetes are non-compliant and don't take care of themselves. That's their mental model. People with diabetes cause themselves to become ill, lose limbs, and disregard their medication or diet regimen. Diabetes is a disease of gluttony and sloth. They bring it on themselves. They don't do what they're supposed to do. They are not even trying to get better. They just don't care. Their non-compliance or non-adherence or whatever it is is so frustrating. Why don't they just do what I tell them to do? And a lot of these mental models that we get of people with diabetes are passed down or taught. When we're in training, we see our, our if we're an intern or a medical student, we see our resident um, talking this way or our attending, or if you're on part of a care team, you may hear the clinician talking this way. Um, and so it, it, these also tend to permeate the air. And even when I work really hard with my patients to not go in any of these directions, they seem to pick it up uh, from society in general. So what do you think the effects or the impacts of these mental models are? And that gets us to what is stigma. Stigma is a set of negative and often unfair beliefs about a group of people or a type of people. It's a negative stereotype. And it can cause disgrace and a feeling of being judged by others. And that feeling of being judged brings on a sense of prejudice and causes feelings of shame, embarrassment, distress, hopelessness, and a reluctance to seek or accept help. So people are influenced by the expectations that others have of them. And there's a famous study where um, teachers expected students to do better and they did better. And the students that the teachers had low expectations for due to misinformation, 
those students did worse. And the same thing can happen uh, in the medical realm. When, when people have a stigma against them and they have feelings of guilt, shame, blame, embarrassment, that can lead to a sense of futility. Nothing, you know, it's not worth even trying and isolation and the pain of isolation registers in the same part of the brain as physical trauma or physical abuse. It's isolation is not a good feeling. So when people have stigma, people with diabetes have this diabetes stigma that we're talking about, they tend to have higher BMI, higher A1C and more fluctuations up and down in their, in their blood sugars, which we now know can contribute to complications as well as just not feeling well. And also is less safe uh, for the person. So why won't your patients with diabetes do what you tell them to do? Well, to start with, I can guarantee that they are, they are not wanting to have poor control. They're not wanting to get diabetes complications. So we can rule out that they're not doing what you tell them to, not because they want problems. That's not ever going to be the reason. But there are other reasons why they don't do what you tell them to do. One of them is that perceived worthlessness. Uh, pointlessness or futility, what good does it do? And then hopelessness, bad things are gonna happen to me no matter what, why even try? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about those. Too many personal obstacles, and we'll talk more about diabetes distress. We've talked about it in the past, but it's different than depression and it needs to be treated differently than depression. Having misperceptions or fears about medication People sometimes think their diabetes is worse if they take three medications and their friend takes two, even if their A1C might be 6.8 and their friend's is 9.8. So the perception of uh, being worse or being bad is attached to medication, fears about medications, and then of course the cost. A big one is that lack of education or self-management skills, and you're all aware of the need for those. And then just life in general, what we call the patient's context, the time needed to take care of diabetes. Just getting diagnosed with type 2 diabetes adds about two hours more of responsibilities per day, even more if someone has uh, type 1 diabetes. The cost of everything from uh, the medication to the supplies to all the doctor's appointments, competing priorities, taking care of their kids or their work or a hundred other things. Um, we consider that their needs and circumstances. And if the patient's needs, their care needs and their life needs exceed their abilities, then we, we develop a self-care deficit. And we really need to take that into consideration when we're asking people to do things uh, for the diabetes. And then the lack of support. Diabetes is life-threatening, but it's not immediately life-threatening. It's people take it differently than a diagnosis of cancer. So it's easy for it to slip behind them and, and they put other needs, more urgent needs, uh, getting their kids to school, et cetera, uh, in front of the diabetes. And then the, the lack of uh, frequent interaction with their healthcare team, what we call touches. And a lot of research has shown even little text messages from the healthcare team can help people stay on top of the diabetes. It's, it's demanding and just knowing someone's in it with you is very helpful. Well, diabetes distress is um, very common. In one study, 48% had high diabetes distress. But you can see by these graphs, if people have even low levels of diabetes distress, like this is the diabetes distress scale, even with a little bit of diabetes distress, their A1C starts to go up, their sense of self-efficacy goes down, the healthy diet and the physical activity go down. Um, people find that People with diabetes distress report that very infrequently does anybody mention that or ask them about how they're dealing with 
how they're coping uh, with the diabetes. Now, diabetes distress, as I mentioned, is not the same as depression. It, depression can cause emotional distress, but diabetes distress is its own unique entity. It is not depression. It's emotional distress that captures the worries, concerns, and fears among individuals struggling with a progressive and demanding chronic disease such as diabetes including the emotional burden of self-management, all the demands, needing to learn new skills, do math if you're not good at math, all of that, and the threats and fears around complications and potential impact on your life and loss of functioning. Um, so diabetes distress is not all that uh, different than diabetes overwhelmness that the care team and and all of you can develop when trying to take care of someone with diabetes. But in addition to all the things that we're trying to help get achieved and accomplished in our people with diabetes, they've got their life and their story in the middle of it. And they have that sense of hopelessness, maybe some fear, misperceptions and futility added in to create the diabetes distress. If we look at the major sources of diabetes distress, the number one is that powerlessness, that hopelessness. Bad things are going to happen to me no matter what I do. Why even try? Um, that, that sense of futility. Second is that, you know, the scarlet letter, letter the Nash negative social perceptions that people are judging me. They have a prejudice against me, that stigma that we talked about. And then surprisingly, third is physician distress. I'm not really getting the help I need. Maybe my physician has negative perceptions about me or they don't know what to do or they're too busy and the appointment's too, too short or they don't understand how hard it is. So uh, we'll talk more about that. So antidepressants are not the answer for diabetes distress. And I think often if somebody picks up on the diabetes distress, they, they put the patient on an antidepressant and that's really not the answer. Now, if they have depression, that may be a different story. But when they look at and really dig into whether it's diabetes distress or depression, diabetes distress is much, much more common than depression in people with diabetes. And in the past, diabetes distress was called depression. And so we had some misinformation going out about how common depression was in people with diabetes. And it still happens, but it's the diabetes distress that's super common. Diabetes uh, distress can happen from people having misperceptions. And I've had people think that their blood sugar should be constant all the time. Well, people without diabetes, their blood sugars fluctuate. So explaining that's just natural. Uh, I've had people think that their A1C should be below seven, which we'd like it to be, but they think everyone else's is, and they're the only person struggling to get the A1C below seven. And sometimes if you can explain, well, only this percent of people have gotten there because it's hard, it's hard work. A lot of people are, you know, around eight and you're, you're starting to get a little bit more risk there, but explaining to them that not everybody else is perfect, and they're the only ones uh, failing. And then other kinds of misperceptions that can cause distress to their life is the thought, okay, I have to avoid all sugar. So they, they won't eat fruit, they look on the milk or the cheese, and there might be some lactose sugar in that, and they think they have to avoid all of that. So of course, diabetes education helps with all of this, but understanding that they can have these misperceptions that add distress. They feel judged. Like I said, people, because I have diabetes, people think I'm a bad person. I caused it. I did gluttony. You know, instead of an A for adultery, it's the scarlet letter of D for diabetes. And even the children I took care of who had type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune condition, the kids at school, when they would, when the when my patients would say, at school that they had diabetes, the other children would often say, well, what'd you do? Eat too much sugar 
or other judgmental type statements. So like I said, it's just pervasive everywhere. It's in the air. The other thing I've seen a lot of is if the person has a heart attack or they get a bad infection and the stress from the infection or the heart attack or some other event, a broken bone, whatever it might be, those stress hormones cause the blood sugar to go up but they go into the emergency room and someone there says, well, what did you eat to cause your blood sugar to go high? And here this person is in distress, now having more distress because they feel like they did something wrong or bad to cause the blood sugar when it was just the, the natural response to that illness. And in fact, when one of our patients has an unexpected high blood sugar, we should sort through whether something like an infection or a fracture or a heart attack has taken place. And as I already mentioned, diabetes adds a lot of work to every day. And it's a job with no pay, no vacation. It's a lot to add in, especially when there's a lot going on in life. And so I think when we as the care team can acknowledge that it's hard, that there's a lot to do versus not acknowledging that, not recognizing the burden that it adds, that can make a big difference. And then as I also um, talked about, we need to be sure that the load or the burden of diabetes is not exceeding their capacity to do that load. And their capacity to take on that load may be different if a spouse is ill, if a child is ill, if they're in the middle of a big project at work, uh, their time may be consumed by other things and less for diabetes. And so that it's a fluid changing type of thing, or if somebody develops uh, cognitive impairment, their ability, their capacity to take care of themselves will, will go down uh, permanently. So to address diabetes distress, uh, there are some um, pretty simple things that we can do. And addressing diabetes distress should be part of the care of people with diabetes. It should be addressed as part of dealing with diabetes, part of taking care of diabetes, not as if they had a separate medical condition or depression. It's just part of diabetes. You know, some days it's easier, some days it's harder, some days it's harder for a long time. And what can I do to help you with that? Or how can I, what can I explain to, to clear up some of those misperceptions? So um, that can happen at a diabetes education session that can happen at a clinic encounter um, and it should happen uh, in those encounters. It could be just acknowledging diabetes is a lot of work, there's a lot of demands, there's a lot of concerns and even fears associated with diabetes. How are you doing dealing with that? You know, most of my patients have a hard time with all of this balancing things. Uh, being sure that they don't put unrealistic expectations on themselves and that we don't put judgment and blame on them. Uh, one of the ways to help not do that is to avoid words like good and bad and instead use words like, well, your blood pressure's uh, not in the very safe range right now, or we've got your LDL level down to a, a much healthier, safer range where it's less likely to to hurt your blood vessels, but avoiding judgmental words like good and bad, and then normalizing that experience of having distress from the diabetes. Uh, and I would talk a lot about this with my patients. Okay, how, how are you dealing with everything? Are most days okay or most days not okay with it? And then recognizing when life happens that that can add those other stressors to the diabetes. Like I just mentioned, you know, a spouse gets sick or you get another illness on top of the diabetes or a child gets sick, um, that, that that's going to affect the diabetes distress. Now, fear of complications is a big contributor to diabetes distress. And unfortunately, the diabetes community has contributed some to the fear of complications and therefore to diabetes distress by kind of using scare tactics to try to convince people to take care of themselves. So the study that I'm sharing with you here 
uh, the researchers looked at magazines written for people with diabetes. So diabetes advocacy magazines, like from the American Diabetes Association, Diabetes Forecast, the Canadian, Australian, and New Zealand Diabetes Associations. And they found that the majority of messaging to people with diabetes was loss framing messaging, such as having diabetes is the leading cause of blindness or the leading cause of kidney failure or the leading cause of amputation, often not offering strategies for how to reduce the chance of getting blindness or kidney failure or an amputation. So kind of using scare tactics, if you, if you don't do what you're supposed to, but not a lot of talking about what you're supposed to do, just these scare tactics. And, and so that led to more hopelessness. This is going to happen just because I have diabetes, as opposed to gain framing, where you say, you know what, we can prevent 98% of blindness by early diagnosis and treatment. The strategy is to get that annual eye exam so anything is caught early and we can get right on top of it. So in the long run, this game framing in a, what can we do to stay healthy? Here's the strategy is more effective. It provides evidence-based hope than the scare tactics that many people result to even these diabetes advocacy organizations. And I think this study came out a few years ago and I'm already starting to see differences in the way things are messaged and communicated. So words matter. Um, this study uh, showed that the importance of language made a big difference in, um, in the uh, outcomes of diabetes care. If healthcare providers use negative terms, such as non-adherent, non-compliant, then the, there was a sense of blame and that judgment and people with diabetes tended to disengage. They developed more diabetes distress. And as we saw, that led to, to less than optimal uh, self-management efforts and outcomes. Just calling a person a diabetic as opposed to a person with diabetes makes a big difference. And mentally, if you just think, you know, Susie is a diabetic versus Susie is a person with diabetes, you already perceive things differently just by changing that verbiage. I've been working on a federal commission to give federal agencies in Congress, HHS, et cetera, recommendations on how to improve the prevention of diabetes and the outcomes uh, of diabetes. And I've gotten everybody on my subcommittee not using a diabetic anymore, but a person with diabetes or people with diabetes. And, um, that, that feels much, much better. On the other hand, language can have a very uh, positive effect and it can support people, make them feel like we're in this together. Uh, I'm on your side, I'm gonna be fighting for you. And again, avoiding those judgmental, good, bad terms, safe, healthy, a healthy range for your blood sugar as opposed to good. You know, your blood sugar is bad, your A1C is bad. Well, your A1C is kind of getting out of the healthy range. That big difference in how that can impact people. And then providing that evidence-based hope and strategies for how to stay healthy. Not just, you know, you better be careful or you'll end up with an amputation. How can you avoid an amputation? Let me help you. Research shows that with good care, odds are pretty good, you can live a long and healthy life with diabetes. There are things we can do together to help you stay healthy and prevent the complications, or if they already have some neuropathy or uh, some albumin in their urine, we, we, we can keep this from getting worse. There are things we can do to help keep this from getting worse. Um, I'm sharing with you some of the jargon and confusing wording, and there's a long list of this. I pulled out uh, from several articles words for diabetes and also for just general medical care. We've already talked about diabetic versus a person who has or a person with diabetes. People who have diabetes sort of start to bristle at the word control. 
And so control could mean how are you controlling your diabetes as a verb, meaning how are they managing things? What are they doing? Or your control is awful, you know, which means what? That their A1C is awful, that their blood sugars are awful, whatever. So we need to say, you know, get a kind of away from the word control. And we all kind of go back to that um, word. Also testing, instead of saying testing, using the word check or monitor, follow, um, good, bad, poor, we talked about that and about using data and numbers as opposed to judgmental phrases. You're, you're below target, you're above target. Uh, being very neutral instead of compliant and adherent. I see you've been able to take your medication maybe about half the time or when we're describing that person to someone else, they've been able to get their diabetes medication in about half the time, um, not using that word non-adherent or non-compliant. Some ones that uh, when they interview patients, when people are told they're gonna be transferred to the floor, you can imagine, they think they're gonna be moved from the bed to the floor as opposed from a unit to a ward. So actually saying that when you're talking to them or telling someone that they need to be NPO, they don't know what that means. You know, well, you need to have an empty stomach. And then we need to be reminded not to use our jargon around patients. That's scary and intimidating and frustrating for them. And then failed treatment, whether it's blood pressure or an infection or diabetes, the treatment wasn't infected, effective, it didn't improve things. And we've heard before that people have different responses to different medications. There's therapeutic heterogeneity. Not everybody responds the same to the same diet, the same exercise, or the same medication. And so instead of saying failed, say, you know, it wasn't effective in you, it didn't work in you. So We've talked before on this ECHO, uh, uh, on ECHO that people with diabetes, uh, American Indians seem to have more futility than other, or sense of futility, I should say, than other populations. And I was reviewing an article recently and I found this survey that actually showed that indeed that's true. And they looked at people, uh, in American Indian clinics in Montana and New Mexico who were referred to specialty care and those who were in non-American Indian clinics referred for specialty care. And there were things unique to the American Indian clinics that maybe limited their access to specialty care like the contract services budget or being eligible or the specialist not willing to take the contract services fee. But people uh, from the American Indians Clinic had less follow through um, or more often lacked follow through. And look here, they had a greater sense of futility about health in general. Bad things are going to happen to me no matter what. Why even bother? And where does that come from? Well, in many conversations with Dr. Ann Bullock before she retired, she said that uh, there's a lot of messaging about American Indians just having bad genes or bad genetics as if they're doomed. And you all have told me that you hear a lot. Everyone in my family has had to go on dialysis. So I just assume I'm going to have to go on dialysis. What research really shows is that nurture trumps nature. The environment, meaning what we do, how we take care of ourselves, actually has a stronger influence on our outcome than genetics. And I think, you know, I'm not sure that that's the whole reason that that messaging, like you have bad genes, you know, it's in your family, we, that needs to be countered. And there may be other things contributing to the futility. Uh, and, and we can talk about that in today or other sessions or, or look more into it. So how do we help overcome futility and hopelessness? Well, if someone is in the midst of futility and hopelessness, motivational interviewing doesn't work well. 
in motivational interviewing, you're trying to engage the person and have them say what would work for them. So, you know, we need to get you to check your blood sugar more often. What do you think might help you do that? And then you have them say, well, if I, if I took my meter to work with me or something like that, well, if they have a sense that no matter what they do, bad things are gonna happen and nothing's gonna make a difference, they have to overcome that sense of futility and hopelessness before the motivational interviewing is gonna do anything. Otherwise they're sitting there thinking, why? It's all futile. Um, here's another thing that I have been telling practices for years, or I should say care teams, be curious, not furious. And even colleagues of mine will kind of come at a patient. You're not taking your blood pressure medicine. I've told you before, if you don't take that, you're going to have a stroke. You're going to have a heart failure. You're going to end up on dialysis. You need to take that medication. It's much better instead of coming at them with all that fury to come at them. Like, I see you're not taking your blood pressure medicine. Can you tell me, uh, is, are you having side effects from it or does it cost too much? Can you just tell me more about why you're not taking that medication? So be curious. Curiosity is a wonderful relationship builder. Um, also take some time to help build that evidence-based hope. If people have a sense that nothing works for them and everything is futile, if you can help show them that they do have, that treatment does have an effect, that it's not futile, that it makes a difference. And we've talked before about how discovery learning, using that CGM data or structured blood glucose testing can say, well, let's see what happens when you do take a walk, check before, check after. Or if you wanna see, say not all medications work for everybody, we wanna see if it works for you, Let's have you check your blood sugar and see if they come down after we start that medication or use the CGM to help determine that. And then to create a positive mindset because the patient has had input and a sense of control over deciding what they'll do as opposed to having things done to them or being told what to do by generating ownership versus buy-in. Now ownership is when you own or share in the ownership of an idea or a decision or an action plan that you have participated in its development, you choose to do it on your own accord and endorse it, and you understand and believe in it. And so you're gonna be willing and ready to implement it versus buy-in where someone else came up with the idea uh, and now they're trying to convince you uh, to do what they want you to do, as opposed to you having a role in uh, the action plan. And that's where uh, shared decision-making can really be a powerful tool. Uh, shared decision-making occurs when a healthcare provider and a patient work together to make a healthcare decision that is best for the patient. It takes into account the evidence-based information about all the available options, uh, the provider's knowledge and experience, and the patient's values and preferences. So it's not just instead of you making the decision for the patient or the clinician making the decision for the patient, you're not, you don't want to just dump it on the patient. You want to do it in a shared uh, process. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. I got to watch my time. Okay. Um, with diabetes and that very high dependence on self-management to optimally manage diabetes, uh, once you've kind of got them out of the futility, uh, hopeless phase, then utilizing those motivational interviewing techniques, as well as considering the patient capacity and the burden of uh, the choice that they might be making will really uh, be beneficial. So if they're gonna need to take a pill three times a day, do you think you can do that? You know, will your schedule allow you to do that? If they need to take an injection, you know, talk to them, you know, how are you, is that gonna to be too hard for you? Do you have confidence that you can do it? What can I do to help build that confidence? 
So talk about their capacity um, and then the burden of care that it's gonna add to their day as part of that decision-making. Uh, shared decision-making is really valuable when there's more than one treatment option and none is obviously superior to the others. And so we see that a lot. Someone's on metformin and now they need to add a second medication. We have a lot of options. Which one's gonna be best for that individual patient and getting some of their input into that. Um, so it's guided by the provider and helps the patients you know, weigh the benefits and harms against their own values and preferences. It makes the experience of care better for the patient. It develops that ownership. So they're gonna be more likely to do it and then they're gonna have better outcomes. And it helps um, improve patient satisfaction. A lot of times organizations are measured on their patient uh, satisfaction. So you engage in shared decision-making when you need to make a treatment decision. Obviously, someone breaks their femur, you don't do shared decision-making. Um, or they're having a ruptured aneurysm, you don't do shared decision-making. But like I just mentioned, there's all these drug options or do you want to do CGM versus just do finger stick? You know, those kind of things are, are really are great for shared decision making. Um, now, some people don't, don't want to. You know, I love doing shared decision making with my patients, but some people say, I don't want to, doc. I want you to just pick it. And so in a way, that is their decision making choice. Um, and so we, we respect that and honor that. And we can still educate the patient about what we choose for them. We don't leave them in the dark, but we don't torture them with trying to make the choice if they don't want to. Um, interestingly, many studies suggest that health providers perceive that people don't want to make these decisions, but the same studies show that people do they, they really would like to be uh, more involved. So the nine essential elements of shared decision-making uh, follow, and I'm gonna kind of try to walk through them as if we have a patient that needs to move on beyond metformin, and we're gonna be trying to do some shared decision-making with them about that. And so we're gonna start by saying, you know, your A1C is still around 8.5, we didn't add any new medications last time because you thought you'd been missing the metformin more than you intended to. And you tell me today that you've been taking the metformin very, very regularly, but the A1C didn't come down. We know that diabetes tends to get worse, that over time people need more medication. It doesn't mean that you did anything wrong, but now we need to decide which medication might work best for you with your lifestyle, uh, what you feel like you can take on, what you can afford. So we have these four different medications and, and I won't take the time here, but we could go over, you know, Actos, we could go over glimiparide, we could go over an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1, or I could say five or insulin. And we could talk through it with the patient and we could say, now, how do you feel about, you know, these can cause weight gain, this can cause low blood sugar, uh, this tends to help you uh, lose weight, this requires an injection, we can get into the cost. We, you know, and then you can say, well, how do you feel about giving an injection? Do you, if I show you how, do you feel like you can do that? Or, you know, talk to them about their, not just their values and preferences, but their confidence, their abilities. What do you need to help teach them to do that? And then your knowledge and recommendations. And I might say, well, you know, you broke your wrist last year. So I'm kind of reluctant for you to use that TZD. And you tell me that you're hungry all the time. So I'm thinking maybe the GLP-1 receptor agonist, or you can use the name of the drug, might be really a better option for you and then kind of go back and forth talking and then you know, be sure the patient's understanding, clarify, let them ask questions. 
and then either make a decision or say, do you need more time to think about it? And then either follow up, well, let's see if that drug's working for you. You know, I'd like you to send me your blood sugars in a week or two weeks or a month or something. Or if you haven't, you know, you need more time to think about it, I'll check back with you um, in about a week. Or how much time do you think you'll need to make the decision? And then I'll check back with you. And it shouldn't be like three months, you know, because we don't want to have clinical inertia if their diabetes really needs some attention. So that's kind of the process of shared decision making. Um, AHRQ has a, a toolkit around the quote share approach uh, where they have these five steps. And I've given you um, links to that. And I've also given you a link to a video made by the VA around hypoglycemia using the SHARE approach. But you want to seek your patient's participation. You know, we've got several medications we can choose from. I'd really like your input. Is that OK if we discuss this together and you share with me how you feel? So seek their participation and then do the exploring that we talked about, assessing their values, what's important to them, um, come to that decision, and then evaluate um, the outcome of that decision. Now, that seems like a lot to do. And Mary Tinetti and others out of Yale have been working on the patient priorities aligned decision making, what she calls the one thing. And so that's where you work with I gotta check my time again. You work with the patient to figure out what is the one thing that's most important to them. It could be feeling less tired. It could be, we heard um, in an echo session not too long ago about a patient who wanted to get off of insulin. So she'd started the GLP-1 receptor agonist and, and had been able to get off of insulin. Uh, but her blood sugars were then going a little bit higher. And so, her, you know, her, she wanted good control, but she wanted off of insulin because she'd been having a lot of low blood sugars. So it, it could be different. It's probably going to be different. Um, so, but this kind of simplifies the process and really gives you something to anchor to, and then you can move on from there. Um, so you figure out with the patient what that what matters most? Is it staying independent? Is it enjoying life? Is it staying connected and able to go to ceremonies and different events? Or is it, I really you know, want to get on top of my shortness of breath or my joint pain or something? And it should be something that matters most over the long haul, not just today. And then what are the uh, activities based on those values? So I, I want to be able to keep going to ceremonies and powwows and all that. Well, what will it take for you to be able to keep going? Well, I, I need to feel less tired. So now you're getting down to more specifics. Okay, to do what I value, I need to feel less tired or I need to feel less short of breath or I need to stop having hypoglycemia. And then you can set your treatment goals uh, around that. So this is an example of a patient um, that Dr. Tinetti used in a workshop and the patient wanted to feel less tired so they could babysit their grandchildren. And they, they were convinced that the beta blocker was what was making them tired, but they also had diabetes and heart failure. They maybe had antidepressant and they may have had deconditioning and they were taking lorazepam. So these were the options that she could try. And so you do what she calls serial trials. Where would you like to start? Let's see what works, or we may need to do more than one thing. And so this is another option for shared decision-making besides the uh, share approach. Um, and then one of the things I, I want to talk about was also the, the skills and the patient's understanding, being sure that your patients really understand what to do and how to do it and that they're doing it correctly. And this was a study 
looking at proper insulin dosage and administration. Um, and the patients were very confident that they could inject properly and calculate the right dose, but that's not what the study found. Uh, they found that many patients weren't injecting properly and that many patients had uh, that lipohypertrophy were not rotating, especially if they were pen users, their injection problems were even greater, or they had difficulty calculating uh, the doses, more difficulty than the patient even recognized. So the vast majority of surveyed patients believed they were doing things correctly. So that makes it important to not just ask, but to do what I call show and tell or show me, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. I, I really worked with a lot of adolescents in my practice, and this was invaluable to me. Can you show me how you uh, pull up the insulin or how you change your set out if they're on a pump or whatever? I mean, it, how, how would you give a glucagon? I'd ask the parents that, not the child with diabetes. Um, so another issue is in calculating uh, the dose, um, diabetes-related numeracy. Now, we know that about 36% of adults have low health literacy, but about 50% have poor numeracy skills, and that's over and beyond those who have mediocre numeracy skills. So we have a lot of people who can who do not understand numbers. And diabetes is loaded with numbers. A1C numbers, blood glucose numbers, carbohydrate counting numbers, insulin dose numbers, all these calculations we ask them to do, those algorithms we give them to follow, dosing instructions, take twice daily, take three times daily, and then the different ranges that we give them. So it, it can be overwhelming to the 50% of people who are not comfortable with numbers. So uh, the teach back method is invaluable, whether it's on calculating a dose, the type of dose to give, how to give an injection, how to take pills. Tell me in your own words. You don't want them parroting back what you just said and copying your words. Explain to me in your own words how you're gonna do this or show me how you're gonna draw this up and inject it. And you could use saline or something or practice using that algorithm scale uh, together. So in my practice, this was invaluable and I think our patients need it uh, more than we realize. This is from that same study where they used a validated di diabetes numeracy test and asked people to do these three calculations. Only 28% did all three correctly, 10% did none correctly. So diabetes is hard. And this is where I think diabetes technology, some of the new smart insulin pens, and then you know some, some of my colleagues would not put a person on an insulin pump if they couldn't do this. I was more likely to put them on a pump because they couldn't do it themselves and the pump would calculate it for them. And those, some of those people were so happy to have the, the pump calculating the dose uh, for them. So a few useful terms we've talked about are diabetes overwhelmness, so something that we get, those of us taking care of people with diabetes. And it can cause us to ca have clinical inertia. It can cause us to have stigma and negative expectations. Diabetes distress is something that our patients get. It's different than depression and it has a huge impact and we can help them out of that. And then that sense of futility, no matter what I do, bad things are gonna to happen to me, why even try? Uh, some good terms are curiosity, compassion, confidence, contextual care, that patients need some cir circumstances, cooperation and cohesion, we're in this together, we're on your side, we're fighting for you. So why won't your patients with diabetes do what you tell them to do? Uh, well, what's the answer? Diabetes is hard. And instead of do what I tell you to do, how do I help my patients with diabetes do what would help them stay healthy? Creating that evidence-based hope and ownership.
and non-adherence is doing what the doc, not doing what the doctor wants you to, or a way to express the patient expresses their preferences and values when they weren't taken into account uh, from the beginning. And this is just a, an article that just came out showing that people were more likely to discontinue GLP-1 receptor agonist if they weren't educated about it, if they didn't have a discussion about it. Um, so just one more uh, article showing how important it is. Uh, these are ref uh, references and resources for you um, on uh, some of these I've shared with you before. Uh, and then more from the what the one thing and then the uh, VA shared decision making. Um, and I don't know how much time we have left for questions or comments, but um, please uh, open up for discussion now or for comments, questions, whatever. That was amazing. That really was amazing. Um, thank you so much for that, Dr. Greenlee. Do we have any questions, comments about the presentation just shown? If you I do, please I think these people are sources. probably on top of it. These are the kind of things they may need to help their care teams with. I think our group's probably on top of it. We do have a good group, good solid group right here. Well, I would like to say thank you so much for that. That really, really touched a lot, uh, even more with the family. And Dr. Greenlee and I were just chatting it up before we started this session about how it runs kind of thick in my family. And my uncle lost his leg to it, but another uncle would always talk about the same things with the sense of that futility, you know? It's like, why do I have to do anything because I know bad things are gonna happen? Uh, regardless. And that has a lot to do with that historical trauma that Ann Bullock and Daryl mm -hmm. Tonema would always talk about. And I think my uncle would get past that point in letting us know that, letting me know that it is that test that creator gives us and it's how we fulfill or how we get through that test that makes us stronger. And that always resonated with me because he himself has diabetes and he went through uh, colorectal cancer. You know, he had a lot on his plate going at it, but every day he would always wake up with that different mentality of, I'm gonna live today. I'm gonna do what I can to get uh, healthier. And he's still living and still trucking along on the farm. Oh, I love that. He's doing great. Yeah. Yeah. So this resonated quite a bit with me and I really, really appreciate the words that you uh, brought with this presentation. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, couple comments in the chat. Uh, Colleen from Seattle says that she agrees and Robin John says, we try. <laughs> Carrie Lopez, our director, says, I love addressing the non-adherence and not putting it on the patient, but the provider. Says, how do we, how do I reach my patient? I think that's definitely strong words as well, because I know you all yeah. working with your patients, it's um, it's pretty tough, I'm assuming, um, especially yeah. if you're dealing with someone like me. Yeah, Carrie said, so right. Instead of blaming the patient for not taking the medication, what's the burden as the care team and the clinician? for helping them through that process and, you know, the curiosity. Yeah. And to me, that was, I cannot tell you how much I love taking care of people with diabetes. Whereas I think a lot of the clinicians you work with may dread when someone with diabetes comes in, but my whole care team loved helping figure this out and helping with strategies to keep them healthy. And it just, it not only helped our patients, it helped us. It helped us really uh, love our work and have happy days. So um, yeah, so keep up the good work. And I think you probably, you know, I wish there was a way we could message that stronger to some of the clinicians that come and go through your clinics. If there's a way that we can do that, I would love to. But I thought by sharing some of this with you all, uh, that you might be some of the messengers around around the message. <laughs>